Hey guys, this is the Cupra Formentor. It's Spanish. And uh, we've actually done a full review of this car already on the channel. We've even done a head-to-head -head between this and the Cupra Leon Estate to check whether SUVs, my favorite, are better than shooting brakes or whatever you want to call them. We've actually been living with a Cupra Formentor now for around six months. So I know a lot about this car and this brand. So today, I want to show you everything I love, everything I hate, and also help you decide whether maybe you should buy a Cooper Four Mentor. So stick around, you might learn something. In fact, I promise you will learn something. Or your money back. This is Auto Trader UK, where we drive the latest, the greatest, giving you the good, the bad, and the ugly. So strap in, subscribe, and if you have been watching, don't stop. Don't ever stop. The first thing I want to talk about is the name Formentor. Formentera is an island next to Ibiza and also Seat Ibiza, Seat Cupra, very closely related. Also, Cupra is a specific type of wheat, bread making wheat on the island of Formentera. So it all, it all connects somehow. The thing I love about it most though, is the logo, which I've already said in the past, looks a bit like a superhero's pants, but it's very clever the way they've designed that to look like the left and right hand sides of the headlights. Very clever design. The rest of it is stunning as well. Everywhere I go in this car, people look at me and they ask me, what is that? It looks really cool. And I agree, it's just super muscular. I love the creases all along the car, the muscular haunches at the rear. It looks a bit like a, a coupe more than a hatchback. But on the whole, yeah, stunning design, particularly the wheels, which look like TSW Venoms from back in the 90s. So looks, they've absolutely nailed it. Now, let's look at practicality. One of the things I've discovered with the Formentor is that it's surprisingly spacious. So it's not much bigger than a hatchback, but the boot is okay. It's 420 liters and it's a decent shape as well. So you can actually carry quite a lot of stuff in the back. It's also very wide, so check this out, right? This, this is the bane of my life. This is our camera bag that we tend to bring with us on shoots everywhere. It's over a metre wide, and look at that. The Cooper swallows it up, no problem whatsoever. On the occasions when we're carrying extra stuff, we sometimes put this bag across the back seat. And the good thing with the Formentor is that the leather in this car is really hard wearing. So that's been in and out of the back seats probably 200 times over the last six months and it isn't a scuff or a scratch on the leather in the car. So build quality, yeah, absolutely solid. Plus check this out. If you want to drop the rear seats, it's just a case of pulling those two tabs and they fold down no problem at all. While I'm on the subject of build quality, I should point out that in the six months we've had this car, nothing has gone wrong. There's been no squeaks, no rattles. You know, sometimes you live with a car and you start to hear weird noises every now and then and you can't work out where they're coming from. Not in the case of the Four Mentor. It's been bashed about all over the place, over speed bumps and potholes and everything has been remarkably solid. Nothing moves, everything is just like granite except for one thing. And it didn't happen to this car, it happened to the Cupra Leon Estate we were driving. The engine start stop button stopped working. And the only way that I could get the car to start was by pulling the button off and poking my finger in the hole. But to be fair, that didn't happen to this four mentor and hopefully never will. While I'm on the subject of the steering wheel, I've got to give a shout to Cupra for the lovely design, first of all, but also the fact that they've got physical buttons all over the steering wheel. This is a VW Group product, and VW are well known for using capacitive buttons all over their steering wheels, which can be accidentally triggered when you're going around corners or braking. But with physical buttons, that doesn't happen in this car. It works a treat. However, the screen, the interface, is still a complete nightmare. Again, it's a VW Group product and they are littered with issues. Say I have tried to make it their own, but it's still full of problems. First and foremost, knob gang all day. The volume adjustment is done via these capacitive buttons and it's a bit of a faff. Adjusting the heating is even more of a problem, especially at night or when you're driving in the dark because none of this is illuminated. You can't actually see. Also, it has this kind of mystery meat navigation system and by that I mean if you're trying to for example adjust the temperature where's that okay top left is it no I've got that wrong you see look it's not not intuitive at all 
there, top. Okay, so at the top, if you're trying to adjust the temperature, the buttons across the left-hand side of the screen, look, there's no writing on them whatsoever, so you can't work out what they are until you move your hand near them, and then the writing comes on to tell you what they mean. And even then you don't know what they mean. Like, what's eye climate? What's air care climber? It's just a little bit too difficult to fathom, especially when you're on the move. Good thing, though, is that it does have Apple CarPlay, which means that you can just whack on Apple CarPlay or Android Auto and generally not have to deal with the infotainment system. One other thing that I should complain about, or at least point out, is that it's got this wireless charging pad down here in the center, and it takes your phone in that orientation, so kind of portrait, and when your phone slides around left or right as you go around corners, the connection can break, which means that your phone might not be charging when you think it is. A better way of doing that would be to have the phone in landscape orientation, where it's less likely to move around. I want to complain about space while I'm in here as well. Look at the size of this center console. Absolutely massive, and yet you've only got one large cup holder. You've got a small one there-ish, I guess, but you've also got this really, really small center compartment, and the door bins aren't massive either, so practicality could be improved in the Four Mentor. While I'm having a moan, let me complain. Actually, no, let me commend these seats, first of all. They look cool. They're also very comfortable and very supportive, very like, kind of like racing seats almost but if you're sitting in the back of this car they're so broad that it's difficult to see over the top of the seat so sitting in the back can feel a little bit claustrophobic although having said that there's a lot of headroom in the back of this car and also it's got these little quarter lights these quarter panels which allow you to see out the side so maybe it's not quite as claustrophobic as it would have been generally though i quite like spending time in this thing i think it's a cool little car it looks good on the outside, it looks good on the inside with all the copper accents. Yeah, I've been enjoying this. Let's go for a drive. Let me tell you what this car has been like on the road. Well, when we first got this car, the first thing that I thought would impress me was the power. This is the top model, it's got 310 horsepower. It's properly quick, 0 to 62 in under five seconds. But the thing that's impressed me the most has been the exact opposite. It's been how comfortable and how easy to live with the Four Mentor has been. Honestly, the suspension is really, really compliant. It's got big wheels, but it never feels like it's crashing over rough surfaces or speed bumps. You can literally just hop in and you can forget that it's a performance car. The first time I hopped in, I looked at these seats and I thought, oh my God, here we go. These are gonna be an absolute nightmare, but not a bit of it. They have been really comfortable, really supportive. They've got lumbar support too, so they've got that really good mixture of sportiness and comfort. Today we're filming this car alongside a Mercedes GLB 35 and let me tell you that's a sporty SUV but these seats knock that out of the hat if that's even a saying. They, they're just good. That's, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, look at him. He's in a 300 horsepower crossover and he's praising the soft suspension and comfy seats. What a right old fogey. But honestly, quite a lot of these performance crossovers take it too far. The BMW X3M, X4M, <laughs> the suspension is just so crashy and so firm that you wouldn't want to take your family anywhere in it. But this, different story. Of course, you can sharpen things up. You press the Cupra button on the steering wheel, you go into Cupra mode, and the whole thing becomes just a little bit more dynamic. You can feel suddenly the suspension is like, hello, I've got a job to do here. And when you do pile into a corner, it stays really flat. It's just a really, really nice car with such a breadth of capability, lovely bandwidth. It'll do whatever you want it to do and feel good pretty much whatever you're doing. I will say it's not quite as sharp, not as dynamic as a hot hatch, for example, a Golf R because it is carrying extra mass and it is designed more for comfort than for all out performance. So when you go into a corner, for example, and then you get on the power, a driving enthusiast might prefer to have a little bit of slip at the rear axle, just to get that back end moving in order for the car to feel a bit more engaging. The all wheel drive system in this car doesn't do that. It's simply there to give you extra traction out of the bend. So right here, get on the power. It just fires you down the road. I would have liked 
a little bit more fun in the vents. However, Cupra have announced that there will be a new top model, the VZ5, which is coming pretty soon. And that will use the same engine as the Audi RS3. 400 horsepower, and get this, it's gonna have a drift mode. Yes, you will be able to slide a four mentor. I really can't complain about the overall pace of this car though, either in a straight line or around corners. We've taken it on so many different shoots and it's always, always managed to keep up with the car that we're filming. For example, we took it to Landau Race Circuit where we had the Golf GTI Performance Pack. We had the AMG A45 and this never missed the beat. It was always on the pace, which is important when you got camera crew in the back trying to get shots of really, really quick cars. It's actually really good off-road as well, surprisingly. I know most Four Mentor owners will never ever take it off-road, but we took this to film alongside the Porsche Taycan Cross Turismo on a rally stage, and it handled itself really well. It was actually sliding around a fair bit, and if I recall correctly, that's pretty much the only time this giant traction control button has ever been used. Why is this there? I guess when we get the VZ5 with 400 horsepower and drift mode, then that might come in a lot more handy. Oh, a quick word on the exhaust. It does like to pop and bang when you're in Cupra mode. I love that. Not a lot of crossovers make a decent noise, but this does. Apart from that weird synthetic noise that it makes. Quick word on reliability. Amazing, really. Had no problems with it whatsoever throughout the entire time. In terms of fuel economy, it's been really impressive as well. Normally, we tend to see around 31, 32 miles per gallon. If you get on the motorway and you drive it sensibly, then seeing 42 miles per gallon is definitely not out of the question either. So despite the fact that it's got quite a lot of performance, it's actually quite frugal when it wants to be. It's probably worth talking about price as well. The Four Mentor is available in a variety of forms. The entry level V1 costs 28 grand, but this 310 horsepower VZ2 version goes for around 41 grand, with lots of models, including a plug in hybrid, in between. The price doesn't seem unreasonable either. At the time this was filmed, Cupra currently has a PCP option where customers put down five grand and pay around 419 pounds a month for 48 months, with an optional final payment of just over 17 grand with 10,000 miles allowance. Full details in the description below. Okay, so in summary, the Cupra Formentor has been a brilliant little sidekick throughout our time with it. It hasn't skipped a beat whatsoever. It looks brilliant. It's attracted quite a lot of very positive attention from people. It's comfortable. It's frugal to drive. It's fast when it wants to be. Do you know what? I know this is, <laughs> yeah, it's boring to say, but it's a fantastic, fantastic crossover that I recommend absolutely wholeheartedly. If you're thinking about buying one, go do it. You won't regret it.